Madam Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, graduates. It's a great honor for me to introduce Mr. Toller Cranston. Toller Cranston is known to generations of Canadians as an innovative and champion figure skater. He is a winner of seven Canadian national figure skating titles, including six consecutive senior men's championships from 1971 to 1976, a feat then unmatched in the modern history of Canadian figure skating. Mr. Cranston represented Canada on the world stage with great success, winning a North American Championship medal in 1971, a World Championship medal in 1974, and an Olympic medal in 1976. Known for his outstanding free skating, Toller Cranston was awarded the medal for best free skater at the 1972, 74, and 75 World Championships. His free skating included not only outstanding athleticism, which was marked by triple jumps, unparalleled split jumps, and inventive spins, but was truly unique in terms of its style, which has been described as lyrical, balletic, energetic, romantic, fiery, and transcendent. Toller Cranston is one of the great artists of his sport. His distinctive performances regularly left audiences, many of us, I'm sure, emotionally moved and cheering on our feet as we witnessed his unique form of artistry on ice. Mr. Cranston coupled his athleticism and complete understanding of the movement of body with the unique ability to interpret music to its fullest and to bring theater to the world of skating. It is not surprising that in figure skating clubs across this country, Toller Cranston remains an idol and one to be imitated for many aspiring skaters. After his amateur career, Toller Cranston continued to contribute to the sport of figure skating, performing in and choreographing many professional ice shows and competing in professional championships. Mr. Cranston has also been a figure skating television commentator and a high-level competitive coach. In recognition of his many contributions to the sport, he has been inducted into the Canadian Figure Skating Hall of Fame the World Figure Skating Hall of Fame, and the Canadian Olympic Hall of Fame, to name just a few of his many honours. Though best known for his figure skating, Toller Cranston's accomplishments transcend the ice. A published author of several bestsellers, Toller Cranston is also an accomplished painter. Indeed, his skating was an extension of this artistry that colours his life. Mr. Cranston's artwork has drawn praise from his peers and has been exhibited in many major international galleries and museums around the world. His colorful, whimsical paintings are multi-layered and often incorporate skating themes. In recognition of his many accomplishments and contributions to the cultural fabric of Canadian society, Toller Cranston was named a member of the Order of Canada. Madam Vice-Chancellor,
Madam Vice Chancellor, in recognition of outstanding contributions to international sport and Canadian cultural life, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa upon Taller Cranston. Thank you very much. I think if everybody stood up, you could help me do this. Why don't we all stand up? And I'll say, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Faculty Senate and the Board, I and everyone in this room together join in conferring upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, Madam President, Mr. Chancellor, honored guests, and a special congratulations to the graduating class. I live in Mexico now and have for the last six years, and every time I come to Canada, on the plane it spawns all sorts of memories. Ottawa has been a kind of crossroads of my life in many ways, being a set for many events that were uh, pivotal to, to my life. One that I particularly remember, is remembered on the plane, is that once at the age of nine, nine years of age, I was coming from the Tenement Royal, which in those days had a figure skating school, and my father met me at the um, old Ottawa airport. And off the plane, I was able to perform for him in the baggage um, level all the things that I'd learned as a figure skater. Um, my father was sort of horrified by this, but the um, passengers that watched me were quite thrilled by it. Um, it was interesting because it was the beginning, as it turned out, of a constant flaunting of self to establishment, um, not getting the pat on the head that you hoped for, but pandering to an audience. That became a narrative for my entire life until this present day. Years ago, somewhere in the 1980s, now we're switching to Bulgaria. I was sitting beside a former Olympic and world champion, Russian. And during the um, viewing of the European Championships, I was commentating at the time, she said to me, what does fat mean? And I said, are you saying that I'm fat? And she said, fat. And I realized it was not fat she was talking about, it was fate. And the difference between fate and destiny sort of harpooned me. Um, I mention this because a, fate is an irrevocable sort of state. In fact, um, it's unavoidable. But destiny, all of which you possess, is something which is quite flexible. There are circuitous routes of achieving one's destiny and I have spent my entire life chasing my destiny in the most unorthodox ways. When I was a little boy, very little, our family lived in Swastika, Ontario, which was not the last stand of the Nazis, by the way. It was an Indian name, a tiny village. And I remember, as clear as day, going out onto this teeny little rink outside the one-room schoolhouse that I attended and skating on a rink that was surrounded by very high snow banks. I was alone and started to express myself as a little boy on the ice. There were two other skaters on the ice and they came up to me and said, in essence, who are you? What are you doing? And did you know that you're figure skating? And I didn't know what figure skating was. Um, 
So for years, I actually thought that I had invented it. Um, in that very same year, I told my mother, which is so unusual for a young child in Swastik, Ontario, that I wished to become a ballet dancer. And <laughs> um, there really weren't ballet schools in Kirkland Lake, Ontario, but I was taken to the studio under the firehouse, fireman's um, residence, and was taken to a room with mirrors and a bar, and um, was told to start, start to do plies at the bar. Um, so my ballet career lasted for 30 seconds. And because I thought you sort of danced around and expressed yourself to music, um, ballet was not going to be for me. But that very same year, um, each year in um, Canadian towns, they have the final recital of the uh, figure skating carnival. And sitting very high up in the bleachers, sitting with my parents, watching my sister, I saw figure skating for the first time being performed in front of me, and I said, that's what I want. Um, it was an acknowledgement, really, of, again, a future and a destiny, future destiny. Um, my career was erratic and difficult. Um, years went by, and although um, I actually became the um, junior Canadian champion at 14, um, my career was really going nowhere at that time. Um, <clears throat> I also, at this time, finished high school and enrolled at École des Beaux-Arts in Montreal, Sherbrooke Street. Um, I knew that one of the problems that I had was never being in physical condition, um, which meant that you couldn't sort of continue through the, uh, the athletic program. So what I did, again, um, sort of voluntarily, was that I would go every lunch hour from École des Beaux-Arts to the next door uh, beside, the, beside the building to the apartment and run up the uh, fire escape 26 flights every day. Um, the first time I did it, I passed out. But I continued to do it and actually did get into top condition. We now moved to the Olympic uh, trials in um, 1968 in Vancouver. And I was in fourth position and only had a few points to climb up to making the Olympic team for Grenoble. Um, I was the very last skater of the day the very last skater of the competition. And I skated, and for the first time, I really was in condition and really skated very well. I mention this because it's pivotal to my career as a skater. When the marks came up, I must tell you I had great standing ovations, but the, um, the marks came up, and from first to 22nd, I had marks from first to last. Of course, I didn't understand what I had done wrong and sort of became somewhat paralyzed because of the shock of, of this, because I didn't know what I had, had done wrong. Um, there was a kind of um, revolution in the audience, and out from the audience came a woman who sort of escorted me under the stairs um, and said, uh, they didn't know who you were, and they don't know what you did, and you're um, ahead of your time, and um, I didn't know who she was, and I just sort of nodded and cried at the same time. But that woman was Ellen Burka. Ellen Burka, um, for many of you people, is one of the great skating coaches of the century uh, on, in the world, and that was my first introduction to her. We are now moving along to the next summer where I skated and was going nowhere um, and ended up in Lake Placid, New York as the um, gardener at the Muir Lake Inn. We're talking like now 16 years of age. And at the end of the season, 
being overweight, fat, out of condition, and going nowhere, one September, that September, I, in a public telephone booth, um, asked for information in Toronto for the telephone number of Ellen Burka. Um, I got the number and phoned her, and she answered. And I said, do you remember me? It's Tyler Cranston, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, would you teach me? And she said, in those days, um, you sort of had to ask other pupils whether or not um, you were allowed to teach um, high-ranking students. And uh, she, I found her the next day, and she said, yes, no problem. I found out subsequently that the, all the pupils said, well, he's so fat and out of condition that he's really no threat to us, so go and teach him. Um, I came, I remember this so clearly, I, my father drove me to uh, Toronto from the Dorval Airport. I had $50 in my pocket my paints and my skates. And I arrived in Toronto and began uh, skating at the cricket club, which lasted one week. I then went to Ellen Burke's house, who lived not too far away, and announced to her that figure skating was not for me. Um, in fact, I was a real artiste and not like everyone else, and this wasn't for me and that I would return to Montreal and become the artist that I knew that I um, was destined to become. And she said, well, look, why don't you move into the basement and for one week you can stay at my house until you find another rooming house. This is a line that I enjoy saying. I moved into the basement, stayed for 12 years, and became three times world champion. Um, that point is important for you, for all of you, because in your lives and in seconds, your life can change. And one must continue to follow one's destiny because even in the last second, um, lives can be altered and destinies can be altered. Now we're going back to the time that I was a very little boy at um, high school in um, Galt, Ontario. And this was the beginning of my painting career. Um, in grade two, there was sort of a competition in the class, and it was on manila paper with crayons, and we had to do a design. Um, my design was completely different from everyone else's, which theirs used all sorts of colors, and mine was like a paisley design in pink, turquoise, and black. Um, it was interesting because the teacher said, yours is the most interesting and completely different, but we can't hang it up with the other people because it's too different, so you, in essence, can't win the prize. Um, again, it set the tone for an artistic career that ran parallel to my skating career and for all the years that I was an amateur, I supported myself through the sale of paintings. Um, if truth is to be spilled, I was a self-supporting artist and um, paid for myself at the age of 16. This is highly unprecedented at the time and even today because skaters usually have, Olympic class skaters, would have parents that would pay for themselves or sponsors, or government. I had nothing and, and had to do it myself. As it turned out, um, it was a tremendous education and a tempering of steel and uh, prepared me for my future. My life, both as a skater and as a painter, um, has been um, conspicuously creative. Um, I have been privileged to have had a creative life with a terrible price, but usually with um, destinies, there's always a price to be paid. I wanted to actually, in ending, I wanted to speak directly to the graduates um, with regard to things that I have learned through my life experience. 
um, things that are important that I would impart to you. One, most important is to take the positive side of tragedy or something negative or failure. Failure can be your friend in all things if you know how to play your cards right. Failure is an important ingredient to one's life experience. One must always take the negative and not end with that, but turn it around and turn it into a positive. With regard to, I must tell you, I'm terribly jealous of your real degrees, but um, with me, I was unable because of my uh, obligation to skating, I couldn't go to university. So what I did is I self-educated myself. Um, that became um, manifested in reading as much as I can, studying vocabulary books, knowing that words would become an arsenal for me for the future. And also, so important, travel, international travel. That was the one thing that figure skating afforded me. I was able to travel, see different cultures, see every museum of the world, and educate myself. Um, the negative became a positive. A very important thing learned both in painting and in skating was how not to be afraid of things and how to live one's life without um, inhibition. Um, the figure skating um, uh, um, can, can only be successful and you can only be successful if you are uninhibited. You have to say what you want to say, stand up for what you to believe in, and go after things, and never to be afraid, particularly where your career is involved. Something which is absolutely non-academic, I'm sure they don't teach this in Carleton University, which is the ability to read the signs around you. I have always been extremely sensitive to signs and believe that every answer to your life is found in nature if you have the eyes to see it. One must also not discount astrology. Astrology is not to be lived by. However, it does tell you the climate of the air around you. Do not um, ignore that. And if one can go further, something which was always a part of my life was numerology. Um, symbolism within numbers. Numbers tells you things. And this cannot be taught by a professor and cannot be taught by, um, through reading. It is taught through personal experience in life. I think that by receiving this honorary degree, it's interesting because human beings are very transparent and predictable. It is my sense that all human beings ultimately want a pat on the head and want to be appreciated regardless of the fact that they may rail against establishment. Um, this honorary degree is a valediction, validation of a very erotic, unusual, creative life. But although I would never bend to establishment, I always hungered and lusted for the pat on the head and the acknowledgement from establishment. Um, this day is important to me because I feel I've received that pat on the head. In closing, to all the graduates, graduating students, I congratulate you. Um, there's so many cliche lines about what you should do, but in fact, what you want to do is out there for you if you will pay the price and embrace integrity. Good luck to everybody and bon voyage.